is EWA Radio, the official podcast of the Education Writers Association, and I'm public editor Emily Richmond. Since 2012, Oregon Public Broadcasting has followed the same class of students, beginning with kindergarten and now into middle school, charting their academic and home life successes and setbacks, and giving a glimpse of the evolution of a generation of the state students. Joining us now is the project's creator, Oregon Public Broadcasting Editor Rob Manning. Rob, welcome to EWA Radio. Hi, Emily. Good to be here. We're also joined by Elizabeth Miller. She is the lead reporter in this year's season of the Class of 2025 podcast. Liz, we're glad to have you here with us today. Thanks, Emily. Thanks for having us. Rob, I want to start with you. What was the genesis for this project? So it started basically 10 years ago when the governor at the time and the legislature in Oregon came up with this goal that starting with the class of 2025, which was a class that hadn't entered kindergarten yet, that every student in the state would finish high school. So basically 100% graduation or 100% completion rate by 2025. And I got into a conversation with my editor at the time that, you know, this wasn't some abstract goal, that this was an actual group of kids who were four or five-year-olds who were going to be entering school that the state had this expectation of. And I said, you know, somebody should maybe follow that class and, and see what happens, not thinking at the time that, you know, I would be rewarded with that idea by being assigned <laughs> to actually do that. And so that's where the idea came from. And, you know, what we had to do was find a group of students, find a classroom or find a school that would be willing to let us do it. And then, you know, form agreements with the parents and the families, you know, to follow them over time. And at the beginning, we were kind of anxious about it. And we weren't saying 100% we're going to do this for the next 12 years. We were more like, we're going to start and see how long we can follow them. And now I think, you know, we've gotten far enough along that we feel pretty good about actually following them all the way through the end of high school. Well, I have to say, I mean, there have been some examples of this in journalism. I'm thinking, of course, about the landmark British series that started with 7-Up and then 14-Up and then 21-Up following people now into middle age, following a group of students starting at that younger age. But really, I don't know of anybody else who has done quite what you have done. I don't either. And, you know, we've kind of looked around, like, is anybody else doing this? And it doesn't seem like anybody has. And, you know, it's sort of exciting on one hand to kind of be feeling like we're kind of breaking new ground here. On the other, I think we are kind of working on the shoulders of people who have done a couple years in a high school or, you know, done work like that. So longitudinal reporting is definitely something that education reporters have done before. But this long of a span, I haven't seen anybody else do. Rob, I also got to give you props in this uncertain time for journalism, building yourself in a little job security here. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> it's the long-term employment plan for, for Rob Manning is that I'll be doing this. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's been suggested to me before. But I, I mean, you could look at it the other way, too. It's sort of like I feel a certain commitment to staying with OPB and staying committed to this project until these kids graduate from high school. So we want to explain that this podcast series for this season is six episodes, and they're organized along themes. Liz, I want to turn to you. Did you map these all out at the beginning and stick to them, or did you leave some room for things to develop and change? I guess a little bit of both. I was forced to do that because of the pandemic, but, you know, I got to OPB a couple years ago and started trying to get to know the students and their families on top of education reporting, but then fall of 2019, that's beginning of the seventh grade year, I just started making a a more specific effort to go to the school, Ron Russell Middle School, where most of the class of 2025 attend school, and really just get to know the teachers, get to know the students, because they didn't know me. I mean, they've known Rob. He's like the, the uncle in the family. And I'm just this new person coming in. So I spent a lot of that fall, winter, trying to just pay attention and taking a lot of notes. I wasn't recording really. And so by the end of that 2019, I was like, okay, here here are these ideas for this season, Rob. Here's where I think it could go. And then January 2020, I started recording. I started doing interviews. 
And then the pandemic happened. And so... And then the pandemic happened. Exactly. It's, it's like everyone's 2020 and then the pandemic happened. And so that really forced us to change most everything. You know, we can't do a podcast about kids in middle school in 2020 without talking about COVID-19. And so that really forced a lot of change in the the season. And so we cut a few episodes that I had originally pitched and we had originally talked about. We added in the episodes about what it's like learning in COVID and what it's like living through COVID. We added those in. But episodes, like the episode about boys, the episode about Rayshawn and Josh, the episode about the new teachers, those were there from the start and were based on things that I had observed in that fall 2019. Well, let's talk about one of those episodes, and let's talk about those new teachers who are having a heck of a first year in the classroom, at the front of that classroom. Let's listen to a clip from that. Each week, there's been less and less assignments turned in, less and less students engaged. And I've been trying to send emails out, you know, talk to parents. I try to let parents and families and students know. It's like, I understand that this is a tough time. It's a tough time for teachers, too, because this is all new to us. So I'd rather have them be safe and healthy than stressed about turning in a social studies assignment. Liz, tell us a little bit about that teacher. Yeah, so that's Nathan too, and he's a social studies teacher at Ron Russell in Portland. And last year was his first year in the classroom. And so he was very nice to a reporter wanting to sit in on his classroom. And so I sat in there a lot and just seeing how a teacher creates a classroom and creates a a learning experience for students, I thought was really interesting and, and kind of maybe a little wonky, but then, you know, you get into the pandemic. And so you have to completely shift how you're teaching, but at the same time, you're worried about your students and their families. And so kind of that balancing, how do I teach them? How do I make sure they're still engaged with school versus how do I make sure their families are okay? I mean, a lot of teachers around the country were dealing with those feelings in 2020. And so I especially wanted to highlight Nathan, as well as a couple of other teachers who weren't new to teaching in general, but were new to that school and new to middle school, to really talk about what it's like being a new teacher and what it's like building that classroom. And then what do you do when everything changes almost overnight? What I think we sometimes forget about kids, and and middle schoolers, I think, are particularly adept at this, is compartmentalizing. So they are able to, you know, put things on a shelf, go to school, have their day, come home, and there can be family challenges. Maybe it's something as simple as, as a disagreement with a sibling or a misunderstanding with a parent. But when school is in the house, those lines are blurred. And I feel this season of the podcast really helped to explore that. Definitely. And even just talking to the families and reaching out to them, I'm sure talking to a reporter isn't the first thing on their list of things going on right now. But hearing, you know, what's going on with families and what's going on with their jobs, it became so much more than how are they doing in seventh grade and and what's middle school like? That was kind of the big question is, you know, what is it like to be in middle school in 2020 was kind of the question that we wanted to answer with this. And there's just way more to do with home maybe than ever before. The third episode of the season looks at how much more time students are spending online these days, both in and out of school, and that's making it difficult to navigate things like friendships. And Liz, you talk about something that I think is probably a universal problem, and that's the drama that comes with middle school, and I don't mean acting class. Let's talk (laughs) a little bit about how that's being amplified right now for this pandemic generation. We're going to hear from a student named Ava. Because in real life, you can just instantly interact with them. And you have teachers at the right moments telling you to quiet down and do work. So (laughs) that time I didn't really get a reminder. That's Ava. And she's talking about, you know, constantly interacting with her friends. And what I thought was really interesting about Ava, I mean, first off, she's really reflective and just really great at just talking about her feelings, which is, I don't know if I could do that in, in seventh and eighth grade. It would probably would have been way more dramatic. But what I thought was interesting about Ava was that she, at home, was spending a lot of her time helping her friends through, you know, stressful situations at home or with friends or with family. And so because of all that focus on friends, she didn't really have time to do her schoolwork, especially in the spring of 2020. So I thought that was an interesting part of how the pandemic had affected students and affected adolescents in a way that I hadn't really 
heard about. And in talking to an expert, Jennifer Pfeiffer from the University of Oregon, that's something that a lot of adolescents do is maybe, you know, talking about things so much that it might not be as as helpful and, you know, spending so much time talking about an issue. And that's something that I think we heard a little bit from in Ava. Some reporters struggle to interview children and tweens, particularly, you know, who sometimes just aren't well great about expressing things. Rob, what's your advice there for reporters? How do you approach interviewing children? It depends a little bit on how old they are, because there are certain things that, you know, obviously work for younger kids that don't work as they get older. And then there are things you can do when they get older that you can't do when they're younger. For middle schoolers, I think they want to be treated as being something pretty close to an adult. You know, like there are things that you can ask them about and they appreciate being given the benefit of the doubt that they have some independent thinking that they can be capable of composing their own thoughts. And one thing that I think has helped, not just in interviewing them, but kind of maintaining relationships over time with them, is giving them as much control as possible. So like being okay if there are certain questions that they don't want to answer, and then trying to kind of nudge them in a direction of, what is something that you're comfortable talking about? And I know that, Liz, you explored this too with like, you know, we had a student named Joel who's just really quiet and reluctant to talk a lot of the time. So Liz talked about basketball and sports and like did things to at least kind of break the ice, which I think can go a long way with kids who are maybe a little reluctant to talk or are maybe a little suspicious of, you know, what are you doing talking to me right now? Liz, you got some great answers when you asked them to talk about some of their favorite apps on their phones and things that they're doing with them. And you found out about something I definitely did not know about and will be grilling my younger nieces and nephews about very soon. (laughs) And that is the rumor page. Can you tell us about this? Yeah, the tea page. I had no idea. And I, I was one of those, you know, older people. I mean, I'm a millennial, but I, I downloaded TikTok and it's it's all... Oh, I, God bless you, Liz. <laughs> it's very enjoyable. <laughs> I, I like it a lot, actually. <laughs> but it really helped in conversations with, with some of the kids. But yeah, the tea page, um, you know, talking to one of our students, Kaylee, about it, who is online, but is also kind of an observer. I just thought it was super interesting. And then I kind of got in this rabbit hole of tea pages on Instagram. I do not recommend that. Um, but... Things just continue to evolve, I guess. And, and, you know, I asked Lena, another one of our students, I interviewed her and one of her friends, Gina, over FaceTime, and I asked them about the tea pages, and of course they had thoughts. So I just thought it was super interesting, you know, using what I heard from one student and then kind of asking everybody else, you know, what do you think about this, about tea pages? It's just, I don't know, it's just really fun, and I feel like it it just helps us know what students are doing and what they're dealing with right now in a way that maybe you don't know if you're not a teenager. We're talking with education reporter Liz Miller and editor Rob Manning of Oregon Public Broadcasting about the Class of 2025 podcast. We wanted to mention this project was supported in part by an EWA reporting fellowship, and there's also a talented third journalist who contributed to it, and that is podcast producer Alyssa Dudley. Don't miss an episode of EWA Radio. You never have to. You can find us on your favorite podcast app. And thank you to everyone who has taken a moment to rate us on iTunes. Your support and feedback are helping us to grow. Liz, I want to turn back and talk about the last episode of the season, which was about Black students who say they're actually doing better learning at home than in a school setting. Before we dig into that, can you explain what is racial socialization? Yeah, so racial socialization is is kind of a a process, a conversation that families, typically Black or Latino families, but not every family, has with their children about what it's going to be like growing up and how they might be treated differently because of their race or because of things like that. So that's something that, you know, experts tell me a lot of families do, but not every family does that. Students talk a lot about the work that they're doing just to navigate things like microaggressions at school and what we would call systemic or institutional racism, things that are built into the way that schools operate that works against them. And one of those things is being hypervigilant about their own behavior. I want to listen to one of those examples right now, and it's from a student named Josh. I didn't want the teachers to think I was the problem or in the classroom mm. and, you know, live up what they thought of my skin color. 
and I just want to show them I was better. Liz, that's tough to hear, but it's also pretty insightful. Yeah, I, I thought so too. And, you know, that was Josh's mom, Sharnissa, in the background reacting. I thought the interview with Josh and Sharnissa that we did over Zoom because COVID was just really, you know, here's what it's like to be a black male in middle school right now, COVID or no COVID. And I think the twist was that at home, they're actually doing better because of not having to deal with systemic racism or, or the feeling like you have to be good so you don't get labeled as bad. But yeah, I'm really proud of that episode. I I thought it was a perspective directly from the students that I thought was really valuable to share and and to hear directly from Rayshawn and Josh what their stories are. There have been a few national stories and regional stories recently looking at things like surveys of Black parents who say they preferred remote learning because it meant their kids were exposed less to things like school police as well as less racism. And I'm wondering, Liz, how does that jibe with the attitudes of the families you got to know? I think it was kind of a mixed bag. I mean, the overall thing that I heard from both of these families is that their students were doing better at home because they were able to focus and they had fewer distractions. With Rayshawn, the other student in the episode, his mom said, you know, he was sometimes the class clown. And so maybe you're not having to entertain as much at home because there's no one to entertain or you're on a screen. But then, you know, talking to them more about it, I I really liked a a moment from Sharnissa, Josh's mom, about, you know, being able to cut out the noise and just get to the work. And so the students are able to kind of have those more direct interactions about class, about academics rather than things around, you know, hey, stop talking or hey, stop making jokes, things like that. And then talking to the experts, I did hear that what you had said that's been reported out about the trust and Black families maybe deciding on homeschooling or or things like that because the educational system and the way that it's set up right now maybe isn't the safest place. And, And that's something that Josh's mom talked about, that she's had these conversations with her husband, Josh's dad, about our son feels safer at home right now. And that's something that I think schools really need to think about once students are back in the classroom in person. Liz, you yourself are biracial. You say in this episode, the best way to understand Black boys' experiences is to talk with them. What advice do you have for other journalists out there who may be thinking about how to improve their own cultural competency? In the episode, we hear from Rayshawn's parents who don't think that race is a factor in in how their son is treated at school or, or what he's gone through at school. And their life experience informs that. And I, you know, I say in the episode, my family growing up didn't really talk about race either. And I think maybe that's something that's happening more. I mean, I'm I'm talking about it more in my family for sure, but just going directly to the students, because you know, later in the episode, I asked Rayshawn what it's like actually being a black male in middle school. And he does say he's treated differently. So even that disconnect between how things are at home or even with your extended family versus how things are at school. I think separating those two and asking students about what things are like at home versus at school is is really important, as well as just, I don't know, reading and being informed and just giving the students time to answer questions in their own words and just listening to them and what they have to say. I don't think I can overestimate the importance of the pause. Yeah, exactly. I learned that a lot because I I don't know if you can tell, but I like to fill silences. But yeah, the pause is important. Rob, you essentially served as project manager here, as well as a producer and editor of this series. And I'm curious for you, what advice do you have for journalists who may want to try something like this, or even on a smaller scale? Or are there lessons that could apply to journalists more broadly, even if they don't have the time and resources to take on a project like this? One of our great successes, I feel, from the beginning of this project is that, you know, we started with 28 families and we have 27 still. And I think that basically came from continuing to treat the families and the children with as much respect and giving them as much choice in how they interact with us basically saying like, hey, we can't do this without you guys. And having them be as invested in the project as possible and also being willing to say like, wow, you're going through a lot right now. We're going to give you some space and we'll talk to you in a few months or you know, we'll catch up with you next year. 
I mean, that's one of the great things about the size of the project is that we can actually go to different families at different times so that we can give them flexibility or, you know, leave them alone when that's what's needed. And so I think that was a big part of it is just sort of, hey, we're not here to like air your dirty laundry or to embarrass you. We're here because you're going to help us tell a story that nobody else can tell. Because the only way that we can tell this story is to follow you over time and for you to share with us what you can. And I think that that can go for whether you're following a family or a couple of students over the course of a school year or over their entire academic career like we've been doing. Are there stories you had to let go of, Rob, to make time and space for this? Well, I mean, Liz can speak to this. It's very, very hard to be producing a podcast of this depth and quality and try to be covering, you know, the waterfront when it comes to education beat reporting, because Liz was wearing both hats all the time, and that was really too much. So what we wound up doing is we did kind of pull her off the beat for a while. And so certainly there were stories along the way that we did not cover or only covered when we absolutely had to. But at the same time, like we felt good about those choices because at the end we were going to be producing something that we felt would be of lasting quality and would be unlike anything anybody else is producing. There's a big jump coming for the students, their families, and of course, for you, and that is into high school. I'm curious what you've learned so far that's going to help you prepare for that. Well, one thing, you know, we, we've had kids, you know, move over time, yet we still follow them. Specifically, Rob follows those kids because he has those relationships. But one thing I've learned is that they might even be splitting up even more in high school, you know, finding what works for them and and something that Rob and I have talked about doing more is just really giving the students the tools to tell the story themselves as you know they're getting older and they have phones and they can record a voice memo or take photos so i think that's something that we're looking forward to exploring with high school and Rob i think you agree with that right absolutely yeah and we're excited to do that definitely And just seeing like, you know, as they get into high school, they just become more and more like adults and more and more like we can see it already and how they were in seventh and eighth grade or how they've been, that they are insightful, they're smart, they're sensitive, they're generous with their time with us. And as long as we can kind of, you know, just maintain those relationships and, you know, hopefully give them a little bit more agency and control over what stories get told and how they get told. I think we're going to be set up for high school to be pretty successful for us. And, you know, hopefully for them too, but certainly as far as the project goes. Rob, what is the difference other than obviously length between radio reporting and reporting for a podcast? Yeah, there's definitely differences. Part of it is tone. You can be a little bit more conversational. You can be a little more personal. You can go really further in whatever direction it is that you're going in, in a podcast, in part because you have a curated audience. You know, your audience is people who have chosen to listen to what it is that you're doing. Whereas the radio audience, you have to kind of bear in mind that this might be someone who's brand new to the area, and we're going to have to explain some background. And with a podcast, you don't so much have to do that. And you can kind of loosen the rules when it comes to like, how long of a a piece of tape should we run? Mm -hmm. Or can we use this sound? I feel like the rules are a little bit less hard and fast in a podcast. And it makes it so that I feel like there's more room to be creative. Liz, what would you say? Yeah, I mean, longer tape was the biggest thing that I think. But yeah, I think the tone was something that is totally different. And just giving things room to breathe and giving ideas room to breathe is is something that we don't always have time for in a radio feature. And so in the podcast, it was just really interesting to, to do that, but also something that we had a listening panel give feedback on the episodes before they aired at OPB. And something that we kept getting back was, you know, we need like the narrator. So there, there's still that kind of storytelling role. You can't just let it fly off the handle and, and, you know, 
give all your time to hearing from everybody directly because you still need that through line. But I think you can do that with the narrator and you also need a through line story-wise. And in the podcast form, I'm very new to it, just gives time to, to kind of explore that way more. I am wondering, based on what you've learned from these young people, particularly in this year, for reporters who are looking at this age group heading into the fall, are there a couple of story ideas they could steal from you? Things that you'd like to see other reporters focusing on, maybe that are less covered? I think, you know, talking about mental health and talking about how students are actually feeling and and faring with this time. I mean, it's well covered, I've noticed, but um, just getting more student voices and how students are feeling about those things. I mean, it might be a hard conversation to have. And I think that Rob and I benefit from having these longer relationships with these students in the project specifically. But I do think taking the time to really get to know a few students and really talk to them about how they're feeling and and what their emotions are, especially in this time, I think is really important. And I see a lot of focus on high school, but I think middle school is is ripe for talking to students about that. And they, they probably want to. I, I don't know. I don't want to speak for middle school students, but I, I do think it's worth looking at. That's where I was going to go to, Liz. And to the extent that reporters can really telescope in on an individual student's experience or a family's experience, I feel like it's really illuminating. You know, we've heard from experts and here and there we'll get some good personal type stories that give us some insight. But I think one thing that I've just been really blown away by in some of the interviews that Liz has been able to do and some of the stories we've been able to bring is what the students themselves and their parents will teach us about what this experience is like and really helps to kind of make you feel it because this is what they're going through. I think it's hugely valuable. And Liz is right. We have the benefit of having long-term relationships with these families, but I think the same principles of just having respect, giving them space, and letting them lead the conversation, I think, can really help tell great stories. Rob Manning is news editor at Oregon Public Broadcasting. Elizabeth Miller is OPB's education reporter. Thank you both for being here. Sure thing. Thanks, Emily. And that wraps up another episode for us. If there's a story or reporters you want to learn more about, drop us a line with radio at ewa.org. The mission of the Education Writers Association is to strengthen the community of education journalists and improve the quality of education coverage. For more than 70 years, EWA has helped reporters get the story right. Have a great week, take care of yourselves, and thank you for listening.